Hello, everyone, and welcome to our July Garden Hour series. Um, if you're first time joining us, welcome. We hope you'll make us part of your monthly routine. If you are regular, we're happy to see you again, and you, we hope that you'll find today's topic very educational. This webinar started in the spring of 2022 as a way to share extension education with gardening enthusiasts during the height of the pandemic. We've had much success since we started, and we've reached over 16,000 garden enthusiasts just like you. My name is Calla Edwards, and I am the horticulture extension agent for Butler County in South Central Kansas. Everyone who has been involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State, either with a background in horticulture education or a related topic. Most of all, though, we have a love for gardening and horticulture and sharing gardening topics. So we just have a couple quick housekeeping notes. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen for questions. Uh, if questions get put in the chat, they tend to get lost. So the Q&A feature is where we will be looking for our questions at the end of the presentation. Lynn Lowry and James Coover are our moderators for the chat and the Q&A feature today. So they will be going through and answering questions and facilitating. Today's webinar is recorded. It will be posted at the K-State Garden Hour website along with some resources that are talked about today. Um, we typically post those the following day and a moderator will share that link in the chat throughout the day. Today's topic is growing culinary mushrooms at home. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker. Her name is Pam Paulson. She hails from the South Hutchinson from the Reno County office, and she is an expert on growing mushrooms. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to her. I hope you enjoy today's topic. Okay, let me get my screen up here. Okay. Okay. Well, today we are going to talk about growing culinary mushrooms at home. And this is something I never imagined I would do, but I was at a conference and sat in on a speaker that is a forester from Missouri, and he talked about growing mushrooms. And I always thought it was there was a lot involved with it, a lot of um, trouble to do it. And he made it sound so easy. Then at the end, he gave me a log and said, take this log home and grow some mushrooms. So that's what I started doing. Okay. So first of all, um, kind of let's talk about what actually a mushroom is. And so the mushroom that we see that comes out of the ground or comes out of uh, a tree trunk is actually just the fruiting body of the mushroom. The main part of that, that fungal organism is underground or is throughout that, that tree or whatever it is colonizing, um, which is this in the background here, you can see all of this white is the mycelium. That, that is the majority of this fungal organism. So only when conditions are right to reproduce is when that fungus puts up the mushroom that we actually see. And actually most fungal organisms don't even put up mushrooms that we know of. So this is um, the mushroom life cycle. And so here we have that, that mushroom that comes up out of the ground that that's what we usually know of as, as a mushroom. So when conditions are right, that, that fungal organism will put up the mushroom and then it drops spores. Those spores divide and form what's called hypha. And then as that hypha grows, it meets up with other hypha and forms with the mycelium, which that is what colonizes most of our soil. And then again, when conditions are right, and usually it's right temperature, right moisture, it'll start to put up what are called pins. And those are just newly formed mushrooms. Those pins will grow and then the process starts all over again. So if we wanna grow mushrooms, we need to consider what they need to grow. So they need moisture. They need protection from direct sunlight. So that was one of the, the misnomers that I always thought mushrooms had to grow in complete darkness. They really just need protection from that, that hot sun. Optimum temperature, which that varies by mushroom species, and then food. And so some of the fungus organisms, 
they obtain nutrients by secreting an enzyme that breaks down larger molecules and then absorbs the smaller ones, which that is just the decay process in, in extra words. Um, so those are called saprotrophs. Other fungal organisms form partnerships with tree roots and other plants, and they help those plants absorb nutrients and moisture from the soil while getting carbohydrates from those plants. And this is a symbiotic relationship. Those are called mycorrhizal mushrooms. And probably 95% of our plants have this relationship with, with fungus in the ground. Those are a little bit harder to cultivate. It's the saprotrophs that, that we can replicate their growing environment. But the main reason or the main role for fungus in our environment is to recycle nutrients by breaking them down. So for the decay process, we have what are called primary decomposers. And so when a plant dies or really any organism dies, those are the first ones that, that colonize that organism. So they are the first ones in, they break down that raw food source like wood. We have brown rot fungi, which degrades cellulose, hemicellulose, and other carbohydrates. Most cannot degrade lignin, but white rot fungi can. So these are some of the mushroom species that we can um, cultivate that are these primary decomposers. So shiitake, maitake, namiko, oyster, olive oysterling, and then lion's mane and comb tooth mushrooms. They're also secondary decomposers. They are not the first in, they are not the ones that can break down that raw material. But once that raw material is broken down into to smaller pieces, they will come in and, and kind of finish the job. So they're the ones that will break down the wood chips or the composted material. And so those that we can cultivate are wine cap, bluet, almond agaricus, and then the button and the portobello mushrooms. So mushrooms, like I said, it has to be the right environment for them to put up the, that fruiting body or the mushroom. And one of the things that they naturally fruit is in response to a stressor. So an extreme temperature drop, like in the fall when we go from the warm summer to, to cool fall temperatures, extended moisture like our spring rains that we get, and then a disturbance. So sometimes mushrooms will fruit in, in response to lightning strikes, um, which I guess there's been research done on that. So what we're trying to do is to replicate that environment to get our mushrooms to fruit. And lightning may not be so easy for us to replicate, but I've heard of people taking their logs that they're growing mushrooms in and dropping them. And, and that is enough of a stress to, to initiate them to fruit as well. So when you're wanting to cultivate mushrooms, um, these are some of the things to consider. So you wanna select the species of the mushroom you wanna grow and then find your source of spawn. Most um, spawn sources are either cultivated in sawdust that you can use or inoculated little wooden dowels. Some people um, will cultivate their own on a Petri dish and then inoculate sawdust and then they have that inoculated sawdust to do their um, continued inoculation with. So you also need to select the proper substrate and it can be log, sawdust, compost, anything that is cellulose material. Now, mushrooms are very particular on which plant species that they grow on or which log species that they grow on. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So you can't just use any log, but you need to have it specific to the mushroom species that you are growing. Then you inoculate your substrate and then it needs time to, to colonize and digest that substrate, which is called the spawn run or the incubation period and then you have fruiting and then you harvest. So when you're deciding what you wanna grow, you kinda of need to look at, at what you have access to. So do you have logs of the appropriate species? Can you get straw, compost, wood chips, sawdust, other materials that might be able to be used? And then what kind of facilities do you have to grow in? High tunnels, are awesome because that allows you to grow and harvest year round or a shed or a heated facility, but you don't have to have an actual structure. You can do it in the outdoors or you can do it like I do in just a shelf in your office. So this is probably the easiest way are these indoor tabletop kits. 
You can make your own or you can purchase them. These um, grow really well in indoor conditions. So temperatures, depending on the species, between 55 to 75 degrees at night. They prefer during the day and then they prefer a drop in the temperature at night, but so very similar to indoor growing conditions. They do need about 80% humidity while they're digesting that substrate and then 80% to 100% fruiting. And so that's what these bags are for. This is a grow bag. They come sealed, but then as they grow, you kind of want to open it, but they have this filter patch on here that allows air circulation. So it lets carbon dioxide out and lets oxygen in, but it doesn't let other organisms in. Indirect light and then good airflow. So there are many ready to purchase fruiting kits or ready to fruit kits to purchase um, that you can get. These have gone through that inoculation um, as well as that incubation period. So once you get them, often you're harvesting within a week or two after opening them up. So all you do is follow the instructions. And again, you're harvesting pretty quickly. So yeah, this is my little mushroom farm in my office. So this is when I first um, started growing some and I purchased a number of different species of, of the um, ready to fruit kits just to see what options were there and which ones I like. So I've got some oysters here on the left and um, Things, these are shiitakes here, the next to the left, and then some lion's mane. See, these are the, the gray oyster mushrooms, and I got them January 19th. I opened the box. They came in a box. They said, open up the top of the bag that it comes in, and then put it back in the box, and then just put this humidity tent, which is just a plastic bag with some holes on it, put it over that, and within a week, I was harvesting the oyster mushrooms. The shiitake tabletop kit, this one said to soak it in cold water for a couple of hours. Again, that's replicating that, that rain period that we get in the springtime. And so that was day one. Day five, they were starting to do what's called pinning or putting up the, the new mushrooms. And then by day seven, I was already harvesting. And so this block, I think I harvested 160 mushrooms within 10 days of opening it up. The portobello or the cremini mushrooms are a little bit different because again, those are the secondary decomposers. So the other ones are grown on, on sawdust of hardwood trees. Th these are grown on compost. And so it comes in this box with a bag of inoculated compost. And you can see the spawn, the inoculated spawn at the top of this compost. And then it comes with a bag of usually peat moss. And what you do is you moisten that peat moss and then spread it over the top of that spawn and that initiates fruiting. So you can make your own tabletop kits. And again, depending on, on what species you're growing, there's difficult to very easy. Most of these um, culinary mushroom species need a very sterile environment. So you need a sterile container. Again, those grow bags are great because when they're sterile and they have that, that good air exchange without letting other organisms in. But then you need to also sterilize your substrate, which that's a little more difficult to do. Um, you either need an autoclave or a pressure cooker. You can steam or boil the substrate, but, but I found that does not get it as sterile as it needs to be. So you moisten your substrate under sterile conditions. Usually it's under a um, like a fume hood inoculate that substrate with the mushroom spawn and then put it in a well ventilated area maintain that 80 percent humidity and usually it takes four to six weeks to colonize that that substrate and then you can start to harvest within another month so that's a little more difficult to do those to do those indoor kits unless you're doing the oyster mushrooms and oyster mushrooms grow very quickly so they can usually outcompete other organisms so they don't need quite the the sterile conditions to grow in so when i do these especially when we do growing workshops i just get a bale of straw i dump it out in my driveway i run it over with the lawnmower a couple times to chop it and then i put it in heated water just to pasteurize it so it doesn't completely kill off all of the other organisms, just the bad ones, 
but it leaves other good organisms that actually help the, the oyster mushrooms to grow. So the water needs to be heated to 160 degrees and then the, the straw needs to soak in that water for about 60 minutes at 160 degrees. If, if it's not chopped straw or if it's not real clean straw, then um, could probably leave it in there for another 30 minutes or so just to make sure it's, it's well pasteurized. And you want to use straw. You don't want to use hay um, because that hay is more lignin where the straw is more the cellulose. So once it's, it's been in there for 60 minutes, let it drain and then cool for 24 hours. And then you can inoculate it with the, um, I use the sawdust spawn and I inoculate the straw. And then you can put it into the fruiting bags or another container. Um, that container should have some air holes. And then within a week, you'll start to see that mycelium colonize that straw and probably takes about three to six weeks to really start to digest it. And um, temperature 75 degrees, indoor temperatures are great. If you can drop that temperature a little bit after six weeks or so, that'll initiate fruiting. Otherwise it will eventually just fruit on its own too. So this is when I first did it, the very first workshop we did. This is my chopped straw. I just put them in stock pots on my, on my stove, which I happen to have a gas stove and I learned you need to turn off the gas before you start putting straw around a gas stove. So this is probably eight, nine years ago and I still find charred pieces of straw in my stove top. So now what I do is I have these big propane burners and these big stock pots. Each of these um, stock pots will hold half a bale of straw once it's chopped up. And I just fill it with water. I heat up that water. I use my compost thermometer to measure the temperature and I get it up to 160 degrees and leave it there for an hour. It does have a lid um, while, it's, while it's cooking, I guess. Once it's, it's done, I just pour it out into laundry baskets so it can drain and cool. And then I put them in garbage bags and bring them to our, our workshops that we do. And so we fill them with, um, fill these grow bags. So this is the, a five pound bag of inoculated oyster sawdust spawn. And I, I dump it out in this plastic barrel here. And each of the participants takes about a half cup of that and then uses these grow bags and fills it with straw and mixes in about a half cup of the sawdust spawn. And then we just clip it with a, a clothespin and set it aside again on your office shelf or wherever you want to. And in about six weeks or so, you start having um, oyster mushrooms grow. You can also put them in just um, five gallon buckets. Once you start seeing that, that mycelium colonize that straw, you wanna drill a few holes here and there because as the, the mushrooms fruit, they will find that oxygen source through those holes and that's where they will come out and, and form. So coffee grounds, newspaper, with, with mushrooms, I call them the Mikey of the mushroom world, or the oysters, I call them the Mikey of the mushroom world because they really do eat about anything. So this is what I usually do with leftovers from our workshops. If there's any straw and um, oyster spawn that hasn't been used, I just mix it all up and I put it in a laundry basket, cover it with a garbage bag for about a month and then open it up and, and the mushrooms start to form. So mostly I just need to keep the humidity and the moisture in that straw for them to grow. This is just a bundle of newspaper that was soaked and inoculated with mushrooms. And this is another way I've been doing it. I also like using the cotton seed hulls. And so these two on the right are just inoculated cotton seed holes. And then you put the little lid over the top and use the cotton ball as a filter. And I do this in classrooms quite a bit with kids or, or other small groups. And it's a great easy way to grow oyster mushrooms within a month. You can see though that because they don't get a lot of airflow, they're more tube shaped instead of more of that fan shaped. The other fun thing to do is take out the center cardboard from a toilet paper roll and pack that with the inoculated, um, either the sawdust or the, the cotton seed hulls, put a bag over it and keep it moist and you'll get oyster mushrooms growing in the toilet paper roll. So those tabletop kits um, are again very easy to do, but you don't get very long harvest because that substrate gets digested pretty quickly. If you want longer production, um, 
longer harvests than log production is the way to go. And so log culture, um, again, mushroom species, each species has their preference of, of log or hardwood species that they prefer to grow in. So make sure that um, when you're doing your log selection, you're selecting the right species of log for that right species of mushroom. So you wanna choose hardwood logs as opposed to evergreens, because if you think about, you know, what are our fence posts made out of, of cedar, of pine, um, because many of our evergreens have antifungal properties. So they really are not good for culturing um, mushrooms in. So hardwood species are the best. I usually like the logs to be about three to four feet long and four to 10 inches in diameter, mostly just so they're easy to handle. You know, they can be as big or small as you want, but um, you want some decent size to them so that they can sustain over time the, the mushrooms that are growing in them. But you wanna make it easy to, to maneuver as well. Some medium thick bark, because that bark is what's going to keep that moisture level up in that wood. And then you want good sapwood. So these are two pictures here. The sapwood is this outer layer here, the, the lighter color. That's where the sugars are stored in that, in that wood. And that's what is going to feed the mushrooms are those car carbohydrates. You also wanna cut your logs from good healthy trees. You don't want dead, dying, fallen trees because those are usually already colonized by something else and those will outcompete what you're trying to grow. So you wanna select good healthy, good healthy trees, cut them in late fall or winter when they're dormant because that has the highest sugar content then. You can do it when the leaves are out, but by then all of those stored carbohydrates are up in the foliage rather than being stored in that wood. So cut them when they're dormant um, from good healthy trees. And then you want to inoculate within two to three weeks if possible. You don't want to inoculate right after cutting because a good healthy tree has natural defenses against other organisms. And so you want those defenses to have time to break down after that, that log is cut. So usually within two to three weeks because then those defenses are broken down but other organisms have not gotten in there. So then you don't have competition for, for your mushrooms that you're growing. I have inoculated them probably six to eight weeks after cutting, but they've been kept in a, in a dry area where they're not exposed to, to outdoor conditions. So this is a chart just showing um, different mushroom species here on the left and then on the top different tree species and whether they do well in those um, recommended satisfactory or whether they're questionable tree species. And this chart comes from Field and Forest Products. Their website here is fieldforest.net. They are a supplier of mushroom growing supplies, but they also have amazing education. And that that's, tends to be what they are all about is the education. I've, I've sat in on workshops by their owner and um, you don't have to buy anything from them, but check out their website and, and check out their, um, information sources because they have excellent publications, videos on cultivating all types of mushrooms. So when you're, you're doing the log culture, what you wanna do to start with is you drill those logs in a diamond pattern and, and make your holes, and this will depend again on the size of your log. If you've got a pretty good size log, make them about six, make those holes about six inches apart within the row and then drill, make rows all the way around um, the log, make those rows about two inches apart between, um, and then you wanna stagger the holes. And I've got a picture that explains that a little bit better. At the end, it'll be kind of in a diamond pattern. I usually leave a couple inches at the end of each log undrilled because the ends tend to dry out anyway. So again, depending on the size of your log, you'll get 30 to 50 holes per log. And so if you're using the SADA spawn and an inoculator, you want your drill holes to be 7 16th of an inch and you drill about a half inch below the bark into the wood. So if you get a five pound bag of the SADA spawn, you'll be able to inoculate 25 to 30 logs. The plug spawn, and I've got a picture of the plug spawn. These are little dowels that have been inoculated. These are um, 
five sixteenth inch dowels is the diameter. So you want your drill bit to be a five sixteenth inch and you drill to about a or a one inch depth into the wood. And then you use a mallet to, to pound those plugs into the, to the log. After you've done that on either of these, you wax the holes. I like to use cheese wax or beeswax that's been melted and then just painted over the holes. I like the cheese wax and beeswax because it's pliable and it moves as uh, temperatures change. Paraffin works, but paraffin hardens quite a bit. And so it tends to break off pretty easily. And all you're doing is just keeping those holes um, and that spawn draw or keeping it moist, keeping it from drying out. I like to label with a metal tag the species of mushroom, the strain. Sometimes I'll even put the type of, of wood, whether it's an oak or maple, and then the date that it was inoculated. So this is the drilling pattern. So if your holes can be six inches apart and then your rows about two inches apart, and then do that drill holes all the way around the log. I mine never look like this, but you know, kind of rough guess. Um, and again, it'll depend on the size of your log. If you don't have a very wide diameter log, you can make your rows and your your holes a little bit closer together. And so on the bottom picture here, are just showing the holes where it looks wet on those holes is that melted wax. So this is an inoculator, and you just, they're a hollow metal tube. You, you poke it into that, that bag of sawdust spawn, which they're doing here, and it's got a plunger. And so what it does is it just makes a little plug of sawdust spawn and the diameter, the inside diameter of this inoculator is 7 16th of an inch, which is why you want a 7 16th inch drill bit because you want good contact between that spawn and the wood of your log. And so you just plunge it into the, the hole of the log. So here we have Chuck, he's drilled his holes and he's got his, his inoculator with the sawdust spawn in the end and he'll just plunge it into that hole. Now I do think those inoculators are pretty pricey for just a, a metal tube with a spring in it. So you do not need to have an inoculator to um, inoculate wood logs, just a funnel with a dowel to pack that, that spawn into those holes works just as well. This is the plug spawn. So these are the little one inch dowels that have been inoculated um, with mushroom spawn. You drill the holes and then you use just a rubber mallet or something to, to poke them into the holes and then use the melted wax to cover those holes. So this is how we do it. We just put melted wax in a, in a pot on a burner and just use a little paintbrush to cover those holes with. And then I like these little metal tags that you can just use a pencil to emboss in. Here they, they have a numbering system for, for their logs. I usually try and write, um, again, the species of mushroom I'm growing. If they have a certain strain to them, the type of log, whether it's an oak or maple, and then the date that was inoculated. And then they need, after you've inoculated, they need an incubation time. And so if you can find a place that's out of direct sunlight, about three inches off the ground if possible. So if you see these logs here, they're sitting on another set of logs. So they are not in direct contact with the soil. So that helps prevent them from getting infected by organisms from the soil. But as close to the ground as possible is best because that's where your humidity is best. So access to moisture, if they can be sprinkled um, two to three hours, one to two times per week. So where I put my logs is on the north side of my garage, which is right by my vegetable gardens. When my vegetable garden gets watered, my logs get watered. The other thing you can do is soak your logs for eight to 12 hours every couple of weeks, especially when it's been hot and dry in the summertime. And so this is where the size of the log is important. If you've got yeah, you know, a six foot log, it's gonna be harder to soak. If you've got one that's just a couple feet long, you could put it in, in a barrel or something to soak. So what you're trying to do is maintain 45 to 60% moisture in the log. And that's again, why it's important to have good intact bark as well. And then this is another way just to stack them. This is called a crib stack. I like this because it leaves 
space open for airflow and um, for moisture to get to all parts of the log. You want the bark to dry out in between watering though, because again, if it stays wet, often you'll get um, mold and fungus growing on the logs that can, can harm your, your mushrooms that you're trying to grow. But when it comes time to fruiting, you want some space between those logs because your mushrooms need to grow. If they're stacked too close, then the mushrooms get deformed as they grow. So what I'll do is just stand them up on end and lean them against the garage when it, when it gets time for fruiting. So um, to do the, the um, log cultivation, they all need about six to nine months initial spawn run or initial um, incubation period. So after you inoculate, it doesn't matter what time of year you inoculate, they will need to go through one warm season. So through a summer period. And then after that warm season within six to nine months, you often can see your first harvest and it depends again on the species that you're growing. Um, but often when we do our shiitake workshops, we'll do those in March and April and by October, um, we'll usually get a few that we can harvest. So again, they fruit in response to the seasonal change or stressors in the weather. So in the springtime, that increase in moisture or in the fall, that drop in temperature with, with moisture. So usually just natural log fruiting, um, you can harvest twice a year, spring and fall. So again, that first harvest will usually be in the fall or if it doesn't cool down and we don't have good moisture in the fall that first year, um, usually then you'll see, you might get your first harvest in the spring instead. Again, deep soaking and hot dry weather um, will help improve your chances for, for a harvest in the fall. The right temperatures and humidity per, for whatever the species you're growing prefers will also improve your chances of a good harvest. So if you do just the natural fruiting, let weather control when it fruits um, and harvest, get those two harvests a year, spring and fall, usually a good sized log will last five to six years. So you can harvest twice a year for five to six years. You can also do what's called forced fruiting. And after, again, that initial spawn run of six to nine months, you can soak the log overnight in cold water. So that replicates that um, that increase in moisture and that, that temperature drop. And then within a couple of weeks, you'll start to see pins forming. And within a week or so, you can probably harvest. And then after you've harvested, it probably needs a good six to eight weeks again to, to digest more of that log. And then you can soak it again. So every two to three months, you can soak that log in cold water um, for about 10 to 12 hours and force it to fruit and harvest about every two to three months. That shortens the life of your log down to probably two to three years as opposed to five to six years. But if you're selling at market or wanting to harvest on a regular basis, that force fruiting is a good way to go. So these are just um, options for soaking them, a stock tank, the kids pool, the fish pond. I have just a tall trash can that I put them in um, and just put cold water and put the logs in there. So these are some of our common mushrooms that, that are grown on logs. So shiitake is probably the most um, commonly grown on logs, but oyster, reishi, and lion's mane also do very well on log culture. And there are others, but, but these are probably the easier ones to grow. There's um, hen of the woods that can be grown, but those logs need to be sterilized either in an autoclave. I've tried boiling those logs and, and got all kinds of fuzzy stuff on there, but did not get the, the hen of the woods in there. So I did not include those that, that are a little bit more difficult. So like I said, shiitake is probably the most commonly grown on log culture. Um, they really prefer oak trees, especially the white oaks, but sugar maples also do very well. Sweet gums, red and silver maple and cherries, cherry trees. So shiitake comes in different strains. They come in many varieties and those varieties are categorized by when they fruit. So warm strains actually fruit better late spring, early fall when temperatures are warmer. Cold strains are earlier in the spring and later in the fall is when they fruit and the cooler temperatures. 
And then wide strain kind of spans between the two. So wide strains, mid spring, mid fall is when you'll get fruit from them. They do very well for force fruiting and are very good for beginners. And so for people that are wanting to actually go commercial production for shiitake, I usually recommend doing 25% warm strain, 25% cold strain, and then 50% of the wide strain. Oysters do very well on logs and they do great on, on a wide variety, especially the softer hardwoods. They don't really care for oak trees, but um, any of the aspens, cottonwoods, hackberries, mulberries, willows, elms, I've seen them on silver maple. Usually when I find them in the wild, it's often on cottonwoods or what I find them on. So you can do the drill and fill method, but oysters also do really well on what's called the totem method. And so with the totem method, you take just about a, a 12 foot or 12 inch section of wood and have two or three of those sections, put the, the sawdust spawn in between the sections, and then you want a cap on the top, whether it's just, you know, like an eight inch piece of the wood, or um, I mean, a, a two or three inch piece of wood, or you can cover it with just paper and that you, that you seal with um, or attach it with a rubber band or a string. Once you've done that, cover it with the whole thing with a large garbage bag and then rubber band it at the top to keep the humidity and the moisture in there. It needs probably oh, a good two to three months or so um, to really start to colonize that log um, up to six months. And really the best temperature for that colonization are indoor temperatures. So you can do this inside, set it off in the corner of, of you know, the utility room or the garage somewhere or basement um, and just leave it in there. You might check once in a while for the moisture, but after that three to six months, you can move it outside into a shaded area, take that bag off and you'll see the whole log will be white covered with the mycelium. Once you take that bag off and, and put it outside all that will dry out on the outside, but the inside of that log is also being col colonized by that mycelium. I've usually, what I've done is just dug like a little two inch holes and put it in, in that hole just to, to stabilize it, put it under some trees where there's some moisture. And then again, that log will produce for probably a good four to five years too. And I really do like the oysters. They're a very mild tasting um, mushroom but again, very easy to grow and they come in different varieties. So the blue dolphin is kind of a grayish blue. The polar white is just a pure white mushroom. I think the pink oyster is beautiful. The Italian oysters have real stocky stems and, and very meaty uh, mushrooms. The gray dove oyster is probably one of the very easiest to grow. It, it's the Mikey of the Mikey mushrooms. Um, this is the one that, that I use for all my workshops and grow in the toilet paper and, and it never fails me. The, the golden or the yellow oysters really do well in Kansas because they are probably the most heat tolerant. And I think they're one of the prettiest as well. And then the reishi mushroom. This one has probably been studied the most for its health benefits. These do really well, drill or fill or the totem method, um, oak and sugar maple, but they also do well on fruit wood, the cherries or plums. This is not one that you eat fresh. Um, I'm really bad when I grow mushrooms, when, especially when I first started, I'd make my coworkers in the office taste them. And this one has the, the texture of, of eating a, a little rubber super ball. So these are meant to be dried and powdered and then they're used in teas and soups. And then lion's mane. This is probably my favorite of, of all the mushrooms that I either grow or forage for. Um, this is also called lobster of the woods. And when you cook it with a little bit of butter, it really does taste like lobster. So these do well, again, drill or fill method or the totem method. Sugar maples, when I find them in the wild, I often find them on silver maples, but red oak, aspen, walnut, um, cottonwood as well. These are very slow to colonize. So usually you won't see your first fruiting for a couple of years after inoculating. So on the left is, is lion's mane. In real good moisture, all these little tentacles will get two to three inches. 
Um, but they're these big round kind of fuzzy looking balls. On the right in this totem is the comb's tooth where they're a little bit more um, separated rather than the big round balls, but they're closely related. Now these are our secondary decomposers. So these are the ones that will grow on wood chips and, and forest litter. So these are bluets here in the picture. Um, these are a little more finicky for growing, but they can be. The wine caps, I think, are very easy to grow um, in wood chips or straw just outdoors. These others, the compost decomposers, Alma de Garicus can be grown, but they are a tropical one, so they will not survive our winters. So they do very well in a high tunnel where they can have some protection. These also do really well in um, container gardens. So if you grow you know, flowers in containers, you can work in some some compost and some, some straw and then inoculate that with the almond agaricus and, and harvest with your, um, with your flower pots. The button mushrooms and the portabellas really prefer cooler temperatures. So these are ones that, that do better in, in that, what I showed earlier, the box of the compost that's grown inside because they just don't do well in our hot temperatures in the summertime. So for the wine cap, again, this is probably one of the easiest ones that can be grown. They grow in wood chips, straw mulch, and the softwood, if you can you know, pick and choose what your wood chips are, um, will produce quicker. You do, again, want to avoid evergreen. So I just get wood chips from our city mulch pile. And so usually there's no telling what's in there because um, it's just from trees that they've, they've cut down throughout, throughout the city and then and chopped up. But I really try to make it not more than 50% of evergreens. Um, as those evergreens decompose, they will feed off of them a little bit, but really the hardwood and the softwood are much better. So what I do with these is I just, I have raised vegetable beds. I work in some extra straw and wood mulch and then work in the spawn. And then I plant my tomatoes or peppers or whatever, right as I normally would. So then as those mushrooms come up, the vegetable plants provide some shade for those mushrooms. So you can plant in early spring for a late summer harvest or plant now July for a late fall harvest, or you can plant or inoculate the, um, the beds in the fall and then get a spring harvest. And so this will continue to produce for a good two to three years, especially if you add continue to add wood chips and straw each year. Um, a five pound bag of the sawdust spawn will cover about 30 square feet of straw or 50 pound or a five pound bag will cover 50 square feet of wood chips. And so my beds are four by eight. And so I just take a one five pound bag and, and mix it in with some wood chips and, and some straw and then the compost and, and soil that I grow my vegetables in. You can do dedicated mushroom beds um, for the wine caps. And what they've done here is just layered wood chips and then the sawdust spawn, more wood chips, more sawdust spawn, and then cover the whole thing with some straw to keep the moisture and the humidity in that bed. And this is just a picture of the almond agaricus. You can also do this with wine cap, just growing in your, in your flower containers. So when it comes to harvesting your mushrooms, and again, depending on the species, um, but about when they're 50 to 70%, open and mature. If they have a veil like the shiitakes here at the bottom, the veil is what covers the gills where the spores come out. You want that to open up um, before, before you harvest. When they're young, like these two on the left, the flavor just hasn't developed in them quite yet. But once it's again about 50 to 70% to open, this, this third one here, that's the, the, opter, or the optimum time to harvest. So you can either twist them, especially if they're growing in a cluster, you want to be careful to not damage younger ones that aren't ready to harvest, or just cut them at the base with a good sharp knife, and then use your clean hands, good sanitation, because you don't want to infect the rest of that, that growing um, substrate. So if you're doing them in the sawdust blocks, especially, be, be very sanitary when you're, when you're handling it, because you Eventually you want to seal that back up and get continued harvest. So as little um, contamination you can introduce is best. Once they get to this picture here on the very right, when it's open and, and kind of slimy, the quality just is no longer there, but also 
other organisms will start to, to colonize that mushroom and then you can end up with a, some food safety issues. So at that point, you just want to throw that probably in the compost pile. So then storing them, and this varies by, by each species, some dehydrate and rehydrate very well, the shiitakes do. The oysters usually just become a powdered mess. So um, a little bit trial and error, what, what works for you as far as dehydrating. I really like to freeze them and you know, cook them just a little bit in either butter or oil, and then divide them up into amounts that, that you will use in a dish and then put them in the freezer. That maintains the flavor the best. If you wanna eat them fresh, best thing is to not wash them or anything. Um, let any moisture on them dry and then put them in a paper bag and they'll last in the refrigerator for three days to 10 days. You can also pickle them or can them, which I have not tried yet, but, but one of these days I will. And there are a lot of different books on, on cultivating mushrooms. These are some of the ones that I've looked at that I really like. Um, and hopefully either Lynn or James can post the, a list in the chat of the books, but we'll also, we should also have it when you can on, the, on our um, Garden Hour website that you can pull up later. And this is just a list of the books. And again, mushroom cultivation supplies, there are a lot of suppliers out there. These are the ones that, that I have used. Again, Field and Forest has um, a lot of products, but again, they have great educational information. Fungi Perfecti, um, both of them the, in the mushroom people have great customer service and, and a wide variety of, of products as well. But again, these are not all that are out there, but these are the ones that, that I've got experience with and, and they've all been great to work with. I think that's it. If you have questions, this is my contact information. I'd be happy to, to help answer questions or direct you to somebody that, that knows better than I do. So with that, I'll open it up for, um, for questions from Lynn or James or, or Calla. Hey, this is Lynn. I only have a couple. Okay. When you were back in the beginning talking about using straw and heating it up to 160 degrees, uh -huh. does the straw have to be new or can it be age straw, like one to two years old? I've done both. I, I do better with the newer straw. Um, if it hasn't been outside where you know it tends to start to break down, it lasts longer. You can use the age straw. It just... it it's already starting to break down. So there's not as much to digest, so. Okay, next question. Is there any mushroom spawn that can be used with Osage orange logs? I always get that question. And again, you know, think about how long those last <laughs> in, in the field as fence posts. And so usually those, are broken down by other organisms after a long time. So they've got antifungal properties too. So there are not any that I know of. And then there was one other question that came to me and in chat. What about morel mushrooms? And that one, they people have tried to cultivate them. But if you remember about the primary, uh, or not the primary, but the the mushrooms that are sapertophs that digest wood and others that are mycorrhizal that have that symbiotic relationship with, with living growing plants. Morels kind of do both. Um, so they need to be growing with other tree species in order to, to grow. And that's, that's where it's difficult. They've been cultivated, but the flavor hasn't been there. So I know there are some people that are looking at planting them with trees to try and get them to grow and get the flavor in there. So yeah, they're a little bit more, more complicated. Okay, another one, the kits you talked about early in the presentation, are they a one harvest situation or is there a way to help them fruit again? Um, with the tabletop kits, usually it's, it's one big flush and then you can set them aside, you know, cover them back up, set them aside for three to four weeks. And, and they'll digest some more of that substrate. And then you can get about half of what you harvested 
the first time. And usually you can do that one to two times, but then that opening it up and exposing it usually introduces other organisms and um, plus that substrate gets digested pretty quickly. So yes, one time for sure, two to three times, yes, but not as much. And then usually it starts getting infected with green mold or something, and then it's just time to throw it in the compost pile. Again, the logs you can harvest, you know, twice a year for four to five years. Okay, another one. One of the mushrooms could be grown on walnut. I remember hearing that walnut will kill livestock. Is that true? And do I need to worry about walnut in my suburban yard for any reason? If, if you're growing walnut trees, um, you want to watch out because they can affect how other plants grow and they secrete juglone into the soil and, and that'll affect other plants. If you just have a log, um, I know, I think the Namiko I think will grow in walnut. If it's just a log, um, that won't affect other things. Are there any commercial growers of mushrooms in Kansas? There are. Um, there is, I know out by Lawrence is, I think it's Wakarusa Farms or Wakarusa Valley Farms. And, They've, um, they grow quite a few. There is another grower that sells at the, the um, Kansas grown market in Wichita that I think she is south of Wichita as well. So those are the two I know of as far as larger commercial ones. I'm sure there are others around too. Is there advantages of homegrown versus store-bought mushrooms? I think so. I mean, one, it's just fun to do, but but price-wise, if you've ever looked at, you know, just a pint of not the, the white button mushrooms, but some of the others, like the oyster or the shiitakes, those get very pricey. Um, yeah, one pint of those, I've seen them for eight to $12 for some of those specialized mushrooms where a five pound bag of spawn costs like $20. If you just buy one, they, they have price breaks for if you buy two to 20 that are, that are much cheaper. And, you know, so that $20 bag of spawn can inoculate what 40 to 50 logs. So yeah, it takes a little bit of time, but, but much cheaper to grow your own. So. And then another question, I think this is about the last, can you add new substrate to further feed an indoor grow kit? You can. Um, what I've done before with my oysters that I grow in the, the um, cotton seed holes is I'll break that up into to new substrate rather than that bag or that container. And instead of adding more to it, I take it and add it to fresh stuff. I break it up and add to fresh stuff. You just need to watch that it's not getting um, colonized by other organisms or infected and so it doesn't always work with the shiitakes and such because those do get um, infected by other organisms pretty quickly where the oysters usually outgrow them and it's a little bit easier to do. Okay, one more. Is it safe to go in forests to harvest mushrooms? I always was told they were unsafe to eat. It's important that you know what you're harvesting. So, um, you know, get educated, go with others. Out of Lawrence is the Caw Valley Mycological Society, and they do a number of forays in, in, um, in the northeast part of the state. It's well worth traveling no matter where you are to go on one of their forays with them because you learn so much, and that's probably the best way is to, to go with somebody else um, the first few times. Because they're, you know, the wild mushrooms, there are so many that, that are good to eat, but then they also have some pretty dangerous lookalikes. So you, you need to be educated on how to tell one from the other. Um, but if you do know, yeah, then it's very safe. So you want to watch for allergies too, but yeah. So. so I take it there's not an app for a phone that would diagnose I, or, or. I ID. would not trust an app. Um, on a phone to, to tell you whether it's a dangerous or a not dangerous mushroom, just because you know, the top of one mushroom can look very similar to the top of another mushroom, just taking a picture of that, but sometimes you need to dig it out of the ground and see what it's originated from or see how the gills are attached and this and that. And just a quick 
picture on, you know, and then putting in an app may not tell you the right thing. So I would not trust my health with just a, a phone app for that. Okay, another question. When is your next workshop for the public, Pam? We haven't gotten any scheduled yet, but usually we do them in March and April in the springtime. So um, you can watch our website or our Facebook site. So we're um, reno.ksu.edu is our, our website. And we've also got our K-State Research and Extension Reno County or our Reno County Master Gardeners Facebook pages. We'll put it on there. Or you can email me and, and I'll, I'll make sure to um, you know, keep track of you, keep track of your name and then let you know when we've got some scheduled. I think that's it. Lots okay. of great comments. Thank you, Pam. Sure, thanks everybody for attending. All right, thank you everyone uh, for joining K-State Garden Hour hosted by Kansas State Research and Extension. Uh, we are glad you could be here today to learn about growing culinary mushrooms. We've got quite a few interesting topics coming up over the next couple months. So be sure to visit the K-State Garden Hour website to see those upcoming topics. Again, today's topic will be recorded um, and that post and all those resources will be loaded on our website. Uh, probably sometime in the next couple days. Um, after this webinar today, you should also be getting a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please fill this out. We really appreciate all your feedback. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at gardenhour at ksu.edu. Thank you again. We hope you'll tune in again the first Wednesday of August for our next topic. Have a wonderful day.